things hoped for by Andrew Clements, day five. And that feeling I've had that Robert is full of surprises, it's not just a feeling anymore. And as we rush out of the store, I'm wondering if it was really a good idea to invite him to stay at Grandpa's with me. We're out on the street, and I have to try to keep up with him. And when we cross the avenue of the Americas, I say, hey, you can slow down. I just looked, and Shadow isn't chasing us. He snaps, not funny. He's really upset, so I say, sorry, I just, I mean, I don't know what's happening. I don't know what that was about. Still walking fast, still snapping, he says, that's right, you don't know. So tell me. But he doesn't say anything, and he doesn't slow down. When we get to Carnegie Hall, I say, I have to catch my breath, and I find a place under the marquee that's not covered with pigeon droppings, and I sit on the low step with my back against the glass in the second doorway. In the shade, it feels 10 degrees colder, and even though I'm overheated, I shiver. Robert sits beside me, and he's breathing hard, too. After a minute or so, he says, Remember how you asked me if I could keep a secret? I nod, and he says, So, how about you? Can you keep one? Yes, I can. I will. He nods, but he doesn't say anything, and I get ready because I have no idea what's coming. He's watching the traffic, so I'm looking at one side of his face, and he's thinking hard. Finally, he says, okay, what would you say if I told you that two years ago, I turned invisible? I want to laugh, but looking at his face, I know not to. In invisible? You mean for real? Like, no one can see you? He nods, still looking at the cars and taxis going by. Right. No one could see me for almost a month, because my body stopped reflecting light. For real. What would you say if I told you that? Is that what you're telling me? Just answer my question. What would you say if I told you that? Well, if I believed you, or if I just wanted to go along with the story, I'd say, so how did this happen? He nods and says, and if he asked me that, I'd say it was because of scientific principles, spectroscopic anomalies, particle light theory, physics, stuff I don't completely understand, but it really happened, and some other people saw it happen the same way I did. A whole group of very smart, very normal people. It happened to me, but they saw it too. So, it wasn't my imagination, and we can't all be crazy. That's what I'd say back to you, if you went along with the first part. About becoming invisible, I say. Right. Of course I'm not going along with the first part, because it's not going, it's got to be some kind of joke. But I'm nodding anyway. I feel like I've edged my way out onto a frozen pond, and the ice isn't thick enough, so I want to stop. But it's not safe to stand still, either. So I take another step, because I have to, and I say, So if we got this far, I guess my next question would be, Who are these other people, the ones who know for sure that this really happened to you? Robert glances at my face, then looks beyond me, scanning the flow of people walking toward us. And I see a tiny flicker of fear in his eyes, there and gone. Then he turns back to watching the cars. He smiles to himself and says, That's the right question. Who else knows? And to answer you, I'd say, There's my mom who teaches literature at the University of Chicago. There's my dad, who's a physicist at the Fermi National Lab. There's Alicia's mom, a serious college-educated American citizen. And there's Alicia's dad, also a physicist and also a professor at U of C. And there's Alicia, and now you. He looks at me. I'm trying to keep my face still, trying not to let my thinking show. But he sees I'm confused, and he, pro he probably sees I'm also a little scared. And I am. Because really, I don't know this boy. For all I know, he's got serious problems. He turns back and stares up at the building across the street. It's okay if you don't believe me. But keep all that a secret anyway. Because it's not a story. And there's more. While we were working out the problem two years ago, I found someone else. Another person it happened to. Only one, but it was important because that proved it didn't only happen to me. And that's what I think we saw back there, in the Nike store. Another one. And suddenly my heart's beating so fast, it's hard to breathe. And my mind is stuttering at itself. No, 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 way. Because I don't know what to think. Because I really did see it, that shadow. A faint, wavy shadow of a guy with long hair, turning his head, looking around. There in the store, up against the wall. I saw it. His shadow was there. But there wasn't a body to match it. And then his shadow disappeared just vanished. I saw it. Robert stands and brushes off his pants. Ready? 
and he reaches down to help me. And when I look up into his face and take his hand, that's when I start to believe this person pulling me to my feet is not a liar. And he's not weird, not at all. And I'm not afraid of him or of what he's saying, because why would he make up a story like that? And I did see it, that shadow. I saw it with my own eyes. I saw it. Riding the subway home, he answers my questions, and I have a lot of them. Because one, once I accept that any of his story is even a tiny bit possible, I want to know everything, all the details. And he tells me everything except he doesn't tell me what triggered the phenomenon. That's what he calls it, the phenomenon. And you? You went out in the public too? He nods and I say, but like, you couldn't wear clothes, right? He nods again, blushing now. Yep, naked as a Greek statue. Takes some getting used to. He tells me how he stood out in front of his high school, watching the kids come out after school, and how he took a long cab ride with Alicia, naked. As I listen, I'm still trying to find a reason to dismiss the whole thing as crazy. But the story is tight. There's nothing inconsistent, nothing off-key, because it's like when I begin to play my violin, if one string is even a little out of tune, it can't be hidden. And I hear Robert's voice and I see his eyes and there's not a single false note. Sitting on the noisy, swaying train, I begin struggling with the idea that someone could be hidden like that. I look around at all the people and I'm trying to imagine what it would be like <clears throat> to be invisible for a month, even if I don't completely believe it happened. I believe that Robert believes it did. I'm sure of that much. And then I have the sudden mind snap. And I know what Robert didn't tell me the other night in my practice room about how he got other over being shy. He had this experience two years ago, and it was like disappearing, shutting off the lights. And even though I don't know what to believe, I'm also sure I really saw that shadow man, or at least something that looked like a man's shadow. And I wonder where that guy is right now. If he's real, that is. If I really saw what I think I saw, or if I really saw what Robert thinks I saw. And I still look at Robert. I try to imagine what effects being invisible might have had on him, if it happened. Because an experience like that would have to leave some marks, if it happened. And then I still look at myself, at my reflection in the window on the other side of the subway car, and I wonder what the experience of just knowing about this stuff is going to have on me, even if it's only knowing that Robert believes it happened. Because I can already feel a change in the way I look at people, and at myself. And it's also changed the way I look at Robert. And not just because of the phenomenon. I'm seeing, seeing him differently because of the way he's taken me into his confidence. That took some courage. After the thing in the Nike store, he could have just laughed it off. Or he could have clammed up. But he chose to tell me. He's trusting me. And I don't want that to stop. Because I want to keep being friends with Robert. I admit that to myself. I really like him. Not necessarily in a romantic way, or even a romantic way. I like him in a classical way. So here I am. My grandfather is a missing person. The most important auditions of my life begin the day after tomorrow. And I'm sitting on the subway next to a boy named Robert who has become my current best friend and who is easily the most interesting person I've met in years. He's a great musician. He's an original thinker. He's a fearless problem solver. And oh yes, he's saying that what I saw in the Nike store this afternoon was an invisible man. And what makes Robert think that? Because he was invisible himself for a month or so a few years back. That's what he's telling me. And even though I've only known Robert for two days, I believe him. And I believe him because I can see that if I'm going to stay friends with him, then I need to accept that what he's told me is true. Accept that it happened the way he says it did. And I am willing to do that. I want to believe him. Because it's sort of like this girl at my junior high, Belinda, who said she wanted to tell me a secret. It was at her house one afternoon, and she made me swear on the Bible that I wouldn't tell, and then she told me that she'd been abducted by aliens. And either it really happened to her, or else she's a crazy liar, because her story was pretty amazing. So Belinda took a risk, and she told me, and after I listened to her stories, I decided I'd just go along with her, because... Well, why not? Why call someone a liar and lose a friend over something that's impossible to prove or disprove, especially when I'll never have anything to do with my own life? Because this girl wasn't crazy, and she never lied about anything else. And that's sort of how it was with Robert's story. 
I can accept it because I want to stay friends with Robert, and it won't cost me anything to accept it, because it's just a story, his story. It's just something that he says happened to him, and he shared it with me, but it's not part of my life, not really. It's his story, not mine. Except I never saw Belinda's aliens, and I did see that shadow in the Nike store, so that's different. We get off at 110th Street and start walking home on Sunday afternoon, and I feel like my world is changing again. There's nothing subtle about it. Everything has shifted, like when a symphony suddenly mo modulates into a different key. And I wonder how many times the world can change in one week. I'm beginning to think that it's a large number. Chapter 10. Improvisation. We are out of the subway, walking south on Broadway, not talking. I glance into the faces of all these people out for a Sunday stroll, but I'm not seeing eyes and noses and mouths. I'm seeing stories. Every person has a story. All the hopes and dreams and fears and secrets. In every face. So many stories, and I feel like I can't ignore them anymore. And then I remind myself that I have to keep telling myself my own story. My story. Because if I don't, then my story is going to get swallowed up by Grandpa's story and Uncle Hank's story and now Robert's story. And I remind myself that my story is very simple. I am a musician. I play the violin. That's all I want to do. I am trying to get into music school. I am trying to keep on my practice schedule. I am not concerned with jointly owned buildings and feuds between brothers and trumpet players with blind girlfriends. Or some invisible bearded guy and a sporting goods store. Those are all bits and pieces from other people's stories, not my story. I have a job to do here. I have to. I've got to get a scholarship to do a great music school, and everything else is just a distraction, an obstacle. Because on Tuesday morning, I have to walk into a room and face the experts with my borrowed violin and prove that I can play the thing. I have to keep working on my story. This is what I'm saying to myself on Sunday afternoon, and as Robert and I walk along, getting closer to home, I resolve that nothing is going to pull my own narrative off, narrative off track. Nothing. I'm a musician. End of story. Then Robert and I are less than half a block from Grandpa's brownstone, and I stop and I grab the sleeve of his jacket. Quick, in here, and I pull him into the doorway of a dry cleaning shop. What? My uncle. He just went up the front steps. I peek around the edge of the shop window, and Uncle Hank is putting his key into the lock. Then he's in the front hall, and I say, let's go, run. In ten seconds, I'm fumbling with my keys. Then we're under the stoop, and then we're inside the ground floor. I can hear Uncle Hank upstairs pounding on the parlor door and yelling, Lawrence, open up. I know you're in there. Open the door. I checked the perimeter before we left. I know he can't get in unless he's got a sledgehammer, but he's making a huge racket and the tenants and the neighbors are getting an earful. I put a finger to my lips and Robert nods and then follows me as I creep up the stairs and into the parlor. Lawrence, open the door. We have to talk. He bangs on the door again and the heavy panels shake on their hinges. I wish the wood were six inches thicker. Then Robert walks right over to about three feet from the door and says, I told you yesterday, I don't want to talk about this. Talk to the lawyers. You're disturbing the peace. Well, stop shouting and go away. Robert's using Grandpa's voice, leaning forward with his shoulders hunched like an old man. I press my hands to my cheeks and try not to gasp, but there's no chance of that. I'm so scared, I can't breathe. In a much quieter voice, Uncle Hank says, Finally, now open the door so we can talk. Robert shakes his head. I don't want to. I'm not going to. Come on, Lawrence. Hank sounds like he's talking to a small child. Listen, I'm sorry I yelled at you on Thursday. And all that stuff I said, I didn't mean it. I'm sorry. I don't want to put you into a nursing home somewhere. You're my big brother and I care about you. But you have to be reasonable. This building was left to both of us. And I need my share of it now. I need it now. Just let me use the place as collateral for a loan. That's all I want. You can still live here and I can get some cash. What's wrong with that? I need the money, Lawrence. How many times do I have to tell you? I need the money. So open the door and sign these papers. Lawrence, Robert breaks into one of Grandpa's long coughing fits. Then he says, I'm not signing anything. You come back next Sunday and then we'll talk. But leave me alone. And don't you bother Gwenny either. Now go away so I can take a nap. After a pause, Uncle Hank says, And next Sunday, you'll sign the papers? Is that a promise? No promises. Send it all to my lawyer. I'm taking a nap. Then Robert turns and shuffles noisy, noisily away from the door. For ten seconds, we both stand frozen, barely breathing, afraid to blink. 
Then we hear footsteps, hear the front door open and then slam shut. I dash to a parlor window and peek through the slats of the shutters. Uncle Hank is already stomping along the sidewalk toward Broadway, a file folder under one arm, hands stuffed in his coat pockets, shoulders stooped, head bobbing as he walks. I actually feel sorry for the man. Robert says, pretty good, eh? I whip around and glare at him. What? That you scared me to death? I can't believe you did that. He shrugs. It worked, didn't it? He would have stood there banging on the door all afternoon. He might have even gone to get the police. And he still might, for all I know, or you know. Robert shakes his head. I don't think so. I predict he's off the radar screen for a solid week. And you can thank me anytime you want to. I'm glaring, still glaring. So what happens when he calls Kenneth Grant or when he shows up next Sunday? He shrugs his shoulders. I don't know. But I know that your Juilliard and Manhattan auditions will be over by Wednesday. And then you, you should be on your way to Boston for your tryout at New England Con Conservatory. If your grandfather's back, he can deal with Hank and the lawyer. And if he's not, then who knows? Not my job, and it's not your job either. We're just two kids trying to get into college, remember? Robert's exasperating, and he's got this superior attitude all of a sudden. And he's also right. We're almost right. Because even though I want my story to be that simple, that I'm just this kid trying to get into college, I know it's more complicated than that. It was always much more complicated, and I'm finally starting to figure that out. I mean, so many things had to happen just right, or I wouldn't even be here. Wouldn't be doing any of this. So many others have been part of my story. Still, it wasn't my mom and dad who boosted me out of this particular tightrope, and it wasn't Uncle Belden or even Mr. Richards. Yes, they all had parts to play, and yes, I owe a lot to each of them. But right now, I owe the most to Grandpa, who took me into his home, who built me a hideout in the basement. He's still holding one end of my tightrope, and right now, right when I want to see him, I can't because maybe he doesn't know how much I appreciate all his help, and that I still need it, but Grandpa's not here. Then it occurs to me that it might also be nice to talk to Robert about this, about all of it, about my whole story. But I'm too upset to talk, so I just say, I'm going to practice. Good, Robert says. That's the right thing to do. As if I didn't already know that. Because playing music is the one part of my story that's still absolutely my own. Chapter 11, No Steak. Walking down to the basement, I take deep breaths. I try to let all the stress dissolve. I try to put Robert and Uncle Hank and Grandpa out of my thinking. Push everything aside until there's nothing left except me and the music. Pyotr Melvenovich taught me that. I can hear this thick his thick Russian accent. The music is not in your violin. The music is not in your bow or your technique. And the music is not in the notes on the page. A hundred years of practicing will not help one bit unless we have the music in here. This is where we must find the music inside our hearts. Sometimes I know what he means, but today it's not working. And I can imagine the judges on Tuesday frowning, whispering to each other, shaking their heads. Who is this girl? And why did we decide to give her an audition? Because I'm playing all the right notes, but I don't hear the music. I'm glad Piotr has taught me the difference. On this Sunday afternoon, I keep playing the notes anyway, running through every piece, because that's important too, to have each note of each score burned into my mind and my fingers. The physical part of the performance needs to feel as natural as pouring water from a pitcher. Still, with just two days to go, I should be feeling actual music. It should feel real. The composer's ideas ought to be burning the paint off my practice room walls. The emotions should be vaporizing the muscles in the violin and the fingers in the bow until there's nothing left but pure thought. Because that's what a true performance is, and nothing less will do. And as I begin the Carenta section of the box Partita, <clears throat> number one in B minor, I remember last night playing for Robert in the dark. That was real music. In our trumpet fiddle duet, that was music and poetry and life and everything else. Everything else that matters. And as I sweep into the stately op opening of the Sarabande section, my mind jumps to Robert's question about playing a fiddle tune for my teacher, about trying to close the gap between West Virginia and Lincoln Center. So for a few measures, I pretend I'm Allison Krauss and I introduce Bach to the soggy bottom boys, but it's the wrong time for experimenting, so I toss my fiddle back into the hills and keep playing violin, which is all the challenge I need at the moment. Playing at performance level is exhausting. It's a real workout, mostly for the mind, but the body feels it too. I keep practicing until my fingertips hurt and my neck and arms are aching, and then I stop because that's important too, knowing when to rest. When I walk back upstairs, Robert has a score of the Hayden Concerto spread across the dining table, and he's tapping out the notes on the buttons of his trumpet. 
I'm not mad at him anymore. He looks up and says, how did it go? Not great, but I ran through everything from memory, so that's good. Want some food before you practice? He nods. I'm starved. You got anything like a burger? I could walk over to that market on Broadway and get something to cook. I get the feeling Robert looks for excuses for walking around New York, and I don't blame him. It's an amazing place. But he could wander off for an hour, and I'm too, too hungry. I shake my head. How about a steak? We've got some downstairs in the freezer. I start to turn back toward the stairs, and he says, I'll go get it. You look beat. He's trying to be nice, so I let him. I smile and say, thanks. The freezer's in the utility room, past the door that goes down to the basement. You can't miss it. Then I go to the oven and turn on the broiler. A minute or so later, I'm putting water into a pot <coughs> to start cooking some green beans when Robert comes back into the kitchen. His hands are empty, and he looks a little confused. The steaks are wrapped in white paper. Didn't you see them? He shakes his head. You better go down and look for yourself. I'm thinking it's odd he couldn't find the steaks, but mostly I'm focused on getting dinner ready because I'm starved. So I walk across the parlor and then down the stairs to the ground floor, and I can hear Robert following behind me. I go past my bedroom door, along the hallway, and into the utility room, and I open the lid of the big freezer because I know there has to be a steak or a roast we can cook up for supper. And in the dim light, I see my grandfather. Grandpa's in the freezer. I don't scream, partly because Robert is standing so close behind me, but I gasp. And then I push out a breath, and it turns into a small white cloud that hangs into in the frozen air. I just stare at Grandpa's face, and I'm numb until a twinge in my chest makes me think back to when I was little, back in West Virginia, because I've been to plenty of funerals, and sometimes they don't close the lid on the coffin. When you go to a funeral home, you know that you might see a body there, so you're sort of ready for it. And I remember when we drove for a Sunday afternoon visit with Mama's Aunt Irene, and we all knew she hadn't been well, and I knew that we might get there too late, and Aunt Irene would be gone, except for her body. It's a big freezer, an old Kelvinator. When it's late at night and the compressor turns on, I can hear it from my bedroom. I don't want steak anymore, so I close the lid, gently. Chapter 12, Suspects. I think you're going into shock. That's what Robert says. But I don't feel like I'm in shock. I don't even know what that is, going into shock. I feel confused, that's all. Like I ought to be crying. Like I ought to be horrified, screaming and moaning, sitting with my legs pulled up against my chest, rocking back and forth. But I'm not doing any of that. I'm just standing in front of the big freezer, and there's a fog all around me. I'm just confused. I don't understand why my grandpa's in the freezer, that's all. I don't understand. Robert takes my hand and leads me upstairs to the parlor. He puts me on the couch, and he pulls a chair over and sits facing me. He says, I'm sorry. I'm sorry I did that. I'm sorry I made you walk down there and look. I don't know why I thought you should see him for yourself, but what was I going to do? Walk up here and say, hey, I think the man in the freezer is your grandfather? I couldn't do it, Gwen, but I probably should have, so I'm sorry, really. There's a big blue pillow next to me on the couch, and I pull it onto my lap and then hug it with both arms. I look at Robert's face, and he's so pale. I can see little freckles on his nose. He's the one who looks like he's going into shock. He's got his hands pressed between his knees, and I've noticed he's wearing the new running shoes from our trip to the store today, which seems like years ago. Time isn't working anymore. I hear myself saying, we have to call the police. My voice sounds like it's out there, somewhere, far away. I say it again, we have to call the police. Robert nods, right, yes, we do. Do you, do you think your uncle did it? Put him in there? I whimper and groan and wail all at the same time because the how question had not hit me, not until this moment, and the question hurts. How did this happen? And I'm seeing my dad's face when he learns about his father and about how Grandpa was found. But I see why Robert had to ask the how question, because this is not an accident that my grandpa's in the freezer. Who could do that and why? Could Uncle Hank do that? Could anyone? How?